Hi, Randy, K7AGE. After my visit to W1AW in the headquarters building, I went up to the Vintage Radio and Communications Museum in Windsor, Connecticut. Now, this is about 20 minutes north of W1AW, still on the way to the Bradley Airport. So if you're in the area, you really should spend some time and go through the museum. Check on their website for hours. Once inside the lobby, you'll see the tube tester that used to be in the drugstores. Remember when you'd pull the tubes out of your TV and go in and test them? And there's also this chest board made up of old vacuum tubes. There are many display areas in the museum. This area is devoted to old radios. Here's the little nipper listening to his master's voice from the old horn speaker. History of radio display, an old loop antenna that's connected to a crystal radio here at the bottom and along with the old pair of headphones. Many areas with lots of radios here. Look at some of the old uh, radios with the speakers on top. Back when radio was furniture. Shelf here just loaded with radios. Look at all those knobs and meters on some of those sets. Some of those have exposed tubes. A little newer selection here again with a bunch of horn speakers on the top shelf and Looks like some of the newer tabletop radios in the Bakelite cases. The old Xena transoceanic radios, all those were just, everybody dreamed of having one of those back in the day. Tuska was one of the founders of the ARRL with, with Maxim, and he also had a radio company located in Hartford. And this is his Model 225. Isn't that just wonderful? Look at those dials and the exposed contacts and the old headphones. The freshman masterpiece, including the log chart in the lid so you could record the settings of all the dials, so hopefully you'd be able to tune in the station again. At kind of the other end of the extreme, the old transistor radios. Remember these with five and six transistors? A radio and television service bench exhibit with the old ICO vacuum tube voltmeter, VTVM, and notice the $1 minimum service charge. Looks like a radio on the bench is needing some attention, located with some test gear, although the scopes I think are a little bit newer than this radio. Looking underneath the chassis, you'll see there's no printed circuit boards, no surface mount. Look at all those condensers, the yellowish tubes with the black markings on one end. Having a schematic would help you troubleshoot and hopefully locate the fault in the radio by being able to trace the circuits. Larger shops would have a stock of Sam's Photofax with the schematics, parts list, and alignment instructions for all the various sets. The museum has a ham radio exhibit including a ham station. Their call sign is W1VCM for Vintage Communications Museum. The ham shack is equipped with many pieces of ham equipment. That's a national transceiver, the silver box on the desktop behind the microphone. There's a Kenwood transceiver on the shelf. And over here is a Johnson Viking transmitter with a matching VFO and a couple SWAN transceivers. No ham shack is complete unless you have QSL cards displayed on the wall. Have you worked W1VCM? Do you see your QSL card here? This is a home-built one kilowatt sideband transmitter built back in the 60s. Just think of the amount of soldering and chassis work required to build that. In the early days of radio it was common for amateur operators to build their own equipment primarily because commercial equipment was very expensive or non-existent. The practice of home brewing reached its peak after World War II when the military surplus electronic components flooded the market, selling for pennies on the dollar. This 1,000 watt CW and sideband transmitter is an excellent example of the craftsmanship that went into these home brew projects. This was built by an engineer who worked at the Westinghouse factory in Springfield, Massachusetts. We speculate the transmitter was built in the mid-1960s, most likely based on plans in either QST Magazine or the Amateur Radio's Handbook, published by the American Radio Relay League in Newington, Connecticut. Here's a shot of the Johnson Viking II transmitter. This was a um, CW and AM. My father had one of these, and when I was a little boy, I would uh, sit in a ham shack, and I would operate the big toggle switch on the front to go from receive to transmit. Here's an old Globe Scout AM and CW transmitter, crystal controlled, and look at all the crystals located on the top of the radio. Over on the right here is some Heathkit equipment, including the old monitor scope and the station console, which had a clock, 
SWR bridge, foam patch, and ID timer. A shelf with more equipment, Harmelin Heath Kit, some National Heath Kit and a National Transceiver, as well as a Swan Transceiver on the bottom shelf. Helicrafters receiver, there's another Johnson transmitter in the middle. Here's a Tentec, some early 2 meter FM transceivers, a Drake transceiver, as well as a Kenwood. A Regency monitor receiver, a BC-348 military receiver, and another piece of looks like military gear. Your CW transmitter looks like rotary spark gap, the blue motor there. On the left, a big transformer. Look at the big coil over on the top right. Newspaper article from 50 years ago of the 50th anniversary of the American Radio Relay League. Chalkboard on the wall. You can sign in with your call. There's myself, my brother-in-law Barry, and his daughter, Laura. Here's an old paper tape code practice machine. You'd wind that up and practice your code. A military radio display, including command sets on the top shelf. Those were aircraft receiver and transmitters used in World War II that were real popular surplus after the war. The museum has a large selection of televisions on display, some consoles, tabletops with the smaller screens. In the display case are some of the smaller solid state sets of the day. I just love this old space helmet looking television sitting on top of a Motorola with its rabbit ears and the television on the left has a magnifying lens on the front to make the picture larger. I think these 1950s Filco sets are really cool with the picture tube separated from the electronics. It's got that space age look that reminds me of the Jetsons. A banner from a television repair shop stating they use RCA television tubes next to the Admiral television. Some professional gear. This is an Ampex 1-inch video tape recorder and an RCA color studio camera. A mostly solid-state Panasonic portable television. Still has a vacuum tube for the display and it was playing I Love Lucy. And this is a 1968 Magnavox 15-inch portable color television set for only $319.90. If we convert that to today's dollars, that's over $2,000. They have a collection of broadcast transmitters in the museum. This is a Gates 5000 watts AM radio station transmitter. It's a Gates radio transmitter, model BC5P, operating on 1080 kilocycles, not kilohertz. AC voltage of 230 volts at 60 cycles in three phase. They don't st state how much current. 5,000 watts carrier, 72 ohms and 10 impedance, 500 to 600 ohms audio. Gates Radio Company, manufacturing engineers since 1922 from Quincy, Illinois, USA. Picture inside of the RF deck of the transmitter, you can see the big old vacuum tubes with the plate caps on the top, roller inductors, look at a big copper strap. That's all part of the output tank circuit. A view of another one of the decks inside of the transmitter. You can see the vacuum tube at the top. Danger, high voltage. Turn off power before servicing, otherwise it'll knock you on your butt. This is a very early, maybe the first, RCA FM radio station transmitter. And you can see the tubes through the windows on the front. On the left is the rear of the, of the RCA transmitter, and on the right is a newer Collins FM radio transmitter. Another area of the museum has old hi-fi and stereo equipment that says before you buy a new stereo consider why some people would rather own a used Macintosh than anything else and they don't mean computer. This is a Dyna preamp and an H.H. Scott FM tuner. These were the hot components back in the day. Here's a pair of 6L6's in the final stage on this Altec audio amplifier. And if you couldn't afford the Macintosh, you probably built yourself a Heath kit and ended up with an amplifier that looked like this. Hanging on the wall in the men's room were several old front pages from newspapers, including this one from a Hartford paper, says Nixon resigns. Springfield, Daily News, President Kennedy shot in Dallas Street gunfire. A session's bullets hit head as bubble top cars target. 
Kennedy is murdered, suspects held, denies guilt, and Johnson is sworn in. From the afternoon edition of the Cincinnati Times-Star, states beachheads are established soon after invasion is begun. Nice display case in the museum filled with vacuum tubes of all different sizes and shapes and colors, some odd shapes on the bottom shelf. Here's a close-up of some of the old blue tubes. You can see a couple of them have plate caps, and on the end is a series of clear glass tubes. This is a big old Westinghouse transmitter tube. Boy, if you had one of these in your ham station, you were hot stuff. Materials used in RCA radio tubes. Boy, I'm not sure I'd want to be around where these things were manufactured back in the day. What do we got? Zinc, chloride, iron, marble dust, wood fiber, strontium nitrate, lead oxide, zinc oxide, strontium carbonite, sodium nitrate, silver oxide. Boy, OSHA would have fun with this. If you used vacuum tubes, you probably used a vacuum tube tester. The meter would tell you when it was time to replace the tube, if the tube was getting weak, or if it was still good. In the lobby of museum, you could purchase a collector's item, a vacuum tube, a lost art, only 50 cents a piece. A display of old personal computers. I recognize a Trash 80, an Apple II, there's a Macintosh on the bottom next to it. Looks like an original IBM PC and a bunch of Commodore equipment. How much of this gear did you have? There's an old radio station display in the museum, control room and a studio. Here we can see the mixing console for the studio. And in the studio is a table with sound effects items as well as a collection of microphones. Just wonderful. Some more of the microphones. I wonder if you can still buy that perforated wall soundproofing tile today. Located on the sound effects table are items like coconut halves, which would be used for horse hooves. There's a chime for the NBC chime. There's a door for opening and closing sounds. The metal on the right is for thunder, some wind chimes, a telephone. And of course, many of the radio shows back in the day were soap operas. So Borax is king. Softens water, saves, cleans, and whitens clothes. Many old telephones on display in the museum, including this display of old wall mount crank style phones, and below them are the more modern desk sets. An old telephone switchboard where the operator would ask you number please, she would then patch to connect you to the party whom you wish to speak with. An old wood style telephone booth in front of racks of central office telephone equipment used for switching, monitoring the telephone lines. Local 1298 on strike against SNET hanging in front of more old telephone central office equipment. A Snoopy and Mickey Mouse telephone and the doll behind them with the bell emblem on her t-shirt. And I would like to thank Chris Kelling, N1WKO, for showing me around the museum. We had a great time. They have a lot of equipment there. Make sure you devote several hours to see everything. Thanks for watching. This is Randy, K7AGE73. And now, our stars, Amos and Andy. Well, after waiting two years for the second payment on the Kingfish's personal desk at the Lodge Hall, the finance company gave up... Yesterday, the back the desk. December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. Banner, Banner, Banner. Our special guest, Big Crosby. And here he is. Hi, oh, ladies and gentlemen, here I am in Long Beach on Christmas Day for these boys in the Veterans Hospital. Please. Breakfast of Champions, bring you the thrilling adventures of Jack Armstrong, the All-American Boy. Well, Costello, first, what's I'm on second? I don't know who's on third. Are you the manager? Yes. You're going to be the coach, too? Yes. And you know the fellow's name? Well, I should. Well, then who's on first? Yes. I mean the fellow's name. Who? The guy on first. Who? The first baseman. Who? The guy playing who first. Who is on first? I'm asking you who's on first. That's the man's name. That's whose name? Yes. Well, go ahead and tell me. That's it. That's who? Yes. Up in the sky. Look. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. <laughs> the 
shadow knows. <laughs> <laughs>